Jesus and a Mr. Fina. Come on, church, let's declare God is fighting for us.
never be shaken We're standing on a firm foundation Christ who is that firm foundation That unthinking sand All other ground can be sinking sand the things around us can be sinking sand. But we will put our trust in the Lord. The same God who was with us in 2023, even as we start this year, Lord, we know you are faithful. Faithful God, unchanging God, from year in to year out, from generations to generations. You are the unchanging God, faithful to your word, true to who you are. Oh, what an honor to be in your presence this first Sunday of 2024. Not by our own might, not by our own power, but by you, Lord, who strengthens us. Who are we that we saw another year? Who are we that we made it to this point? Who are we that you gave us another chance? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Ebenezer King, Ebenezer Lord. For thus far, the Lord, you have been with us. We will not be shaken. We're standing on a firm foundation. We will not be shaken. Father, even today as we come into your presence, we honor you. We glorify you. We submit everything that we are unto you, King of Kings. Thank you for life. Thank you for life. Thank you for life, Lord. Thank you for life. Thank you for life. For the breath in our lungs, thank you. For the voices that we have to worship you today, thank you, Lord. For us being physically here, thank you, Jesus. Who are we, Lord, that we would get a chance to be in your presence? We honor you, King of Kings. We glorify you. We bow ourselves before you, submitting it all unto you, Lord. For you are the Lord who reigns, the Lord seated on the throne. A majestic God, everlasting King of Kings, sovereign and supreme, the one who sits on the throne, unchanging Jesus, holy Messiah, the Rose of Sharon. Thank you, God, this morning. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for who you are. Even at this moment as we come into your presence, we acknowledge your kingship. Thank you, Lord. Church, go ahead and take this time and greet just five people next to you. Don't forget to say happy, happy 2024. We made it. Since you saw them last year, church, Happy 2024. Compliments and blessings for this year. What an honor, what a privilege to spend the first Sunday of 2024 in the house of the Lord. You are at the right place at the right time. Church, give your hand, yourselves a round of applause. First Sunday, and this is just testimony of what God is about to do this year. You started off on the right foot. You started off in the right place. And God is about to do amazing things this year. Amen. For those of you who are here for the very, very first time, welcome to City Life Church. We just want to love on you. Can you be so brave and put up your hand? Our host will be coming around with a welcome card. I see your hand over there. Welcome to church. I see your hand. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome. I see your hands at the back. Keep your hand up. Our host will be coming around to you to give you that welcome card. Please fill it in 
And while you're filling it in during the offering, feel free to drop it off in the offering basket or you can drop it off at the welcome desk. Church, it's time for the offering. You guys definitely sound more excited than the first encounter. Church, you are ready for the offering. Luke 16 verse 10 says, Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. Church, even as we start this year, I'm sure you've got a lot of goals, ambitions that you've written down. But I wanted to encourage us to say, as we start this year, as you set your goals and resolutions, let us be faithful in the things of the Lord, even with our finances. Let us be faithful in our tithing. Let us be faithful in our offering. Let us be faithful in our generosity. Because it's in our faithfulness that our integrity is tested. Tested in the big things, tested in the small things. Tested when people see you, tested when people don't see you. A very simple example that I gave in the first encounter was a couple of months ago, husband and I were in Pretoria CBD trying to find parking. It's packed and an un... You know the car guards that you know it's not a car guard is leading you into parking that you know you shouldn't be parking at, but everybody's parking there. Leads us into that parking, of course we park there. Three hours later, after all the shopping, we come back and the car is not there. Heart sinks and we're thinking, oh Lord, the car is stolen. My husband says, no, I think we have been told. I kind of had a feeling about this. And we're thinking, oh man, what now? Another car guard tells us, no, don't worry, Brayaka. When I woke up at a cool drink, if you just pay that cool drink money, you'll get your car real soon. The cops just took it, impounded it, go check it out there. Okay, fine. Call the Uber, picks us up with everything, and he directs us to the impound. He's like, oh, your car got impounded. Don't worry. Happened to me as well a couple of weeks ago. All you have to do, just pay the cool drink. What's I woke up for cool drink? You'll be f- and this cool drink is not a Coca-Cola, Saints. So we get there. My husband and I look at each other and we're like, we are not paying that cool drink. We get in there, the cops obviously are expecting it because that's their lunch money. And because we had decided that we will be faithful in the small things, we paid the full price because you know, if you do something wrong, you're going to pay for it. And that was just testimony to say, God, teach us, help us to be faithful in the small things so that Lord, you can entrust us even in the big things. It's not in the extravagant things where you're like, Lord, if I get a million, I know for sure I will do the right things. But it's in the everyday faithfulness, everyday commitment, every day to say, I will tithe. I will use the finances that God has blessed me with for the glory of his kingdom. I will not let my faith be hindered in my walk, even when there are challenges. Because sometimes the things of the Lord are tough. We could have saved the rest of the money and paid the cool drink. But you had to pay the full price because we chose to be faithful. So even as we start this year, church, let us be faithful in our finances. And God will entrust us with the most. Let's stand on our feet as we get ready to give. There are many ways to give in the church. We've got the banking details on the screen where you can pay via EFT. We also have snap scan on the armrest that you can use your phone on. We've got our beautiful host that be coming around with the offering baskets. And you can also give via card at the card machine at the back with the welcome team. But for now, let us sing, let us dance, and let's give faithfully to the things of the Lord with the worship team. There is a race that I must run. There are victories to be won.
the offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you, Lord God Almighty, that we can our, run our race faithfully, even with our finances. Father, with strength from you and trusting that you are our ultimate provider, we trust you this year with our finances and everything surrounding that. We know that you're a faithful God to see us to fruition. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the church say amen. Go ahead and take your seat, church. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before the anchors come up. Please kindly note that we do still have complimentary tea and coffee available in the cafe. So for all our newcomers, please don't rush off after the encounter. Mingle, get to know somebody, create community, find out how people's holidays were and what they'll be doing for the rest of the year. And that's how we build that family. Amen, church. Children's Church is up and running. I know the parents saw flames during New Year's service and other services where the kids were in the encounter, but we're happy to announce that Kids Church is open and they are taking from one-year-olds up until 12-year-olds. Feel free to check in your kids next week Sunday for that encounter. We also have the parents' lounge that's available for all the younger ones that might get a little... Um, uncomfortable during the encounter it's to my right your left screens are running so you won't miss a single thing of the encounter there's also air conditioning and toys for the little ones but for any other further announcements please feel free to ask the welcome desk at the back they'll be happy to help you but for the rest of the news please let's take a look at the anchors for the news hey everybody and welcome we're so glad that you have joined us today and thank you so much for coming and we pray that you have brought your friends and your family and that you've already had such an incredible encounter hey we want to let you know about our tuesday prayer evenings these are things that you do not want to miss at all you want to be there uh, the next one that we have coming up is going to be tuesday night the 2nd of april it's going to be happening from 6 to 7 p.m right here at our lone hill location and it's just a great time of prayer and worship where we pray together, we connect with one another, we come before God and we just bring our requests and we make it known. And so we want to invite you to that. Bring everybody you know, you won't regret it. That's right, church. So very exciting. Also, we have our Grow Nights coming up. It's going to be awesome. Pastor Nick is going to be kicking us off. Um, our very first Grow Night is going to be happening on the 11th of April. Um, it's such an awesome opportunity for you to grow deeper in the Word, Go deeper in your relationship with Christ and our first session is going to be all about the um, foundations of our faith. It is called Biblical Foundations. So we cannot wait to see you there um, to get into our awesome Grow Nights. That's right, it's going to be happening over six weeks long. Our first night is happening on the 11th of April from 6.30 to 9 p.m. All you have to bring is a notebook and a pen or something to take notes on. It's completely free. Like Aviwe said, you're going to get a lot of Bible, a lot of the Word. We're going to explore just the incredible nature of who God is, go through some very foundational things that we believe and love about our faith. So please make sure that you make an effort to get there. And if you want to sign up for this, you can do so by emailing uh, info at citylifechurch.co.za or heading over to the welcome desk after today's encounter. Well, church, that's the end of our church news for you today. We hope that you have an incredible rest of your encounter and open doors Sunday. And we will see you next week with more church news. My word this morning is entitled, The Reward of the Resilient. Man, that's a cool title. I must tell you, it's like writing a book every week, trying to think of a title, you know, and you come up with the weird, the wacky, but actually, the reward of the resilient. If you are resilient in the season, there is a reward for you. I want you to know that. You see, I was just kind of praying and, and seeking the Lord and just saying, God, how can we make today's word really practical for our people? And I really wanted to give you a picture this morning of three categories that I believe every single one of us would perceive that we fall into with where our lives are right now. For some of us, we would say, you know what, I'm, I'm just failing. It just feels like everything I do, I'm falling short. I can't make it. I'm just kind of not getting there. I'm going backwards. There are people here in this house this morning that would say, you know what, pastor, I'm just surviving. 
I'm a survivor. I'm going to make it. Come on. That you're just surviving. You're just carrying on. And then there are people here today who would actually have a perception that, you know what? Despite everything, I am actually prospering. Actually, my life is moving forward. Every single person in this auditorium today has a metric, a benchmark, or a standard within one's own thinking that would dictate as to which area you feel is most appropriate for where you are in your life right now. Let's give it up. Is that Lee? Let's give it up for Lee. Come on. Lee is on camera. We, we are struggling, people. We've got one little, little amateur hour camera here. <laughs> Anyone ever, it's like holding a phone and trying to stay into focus. So I wanna ask you, watch me, don't watch the, 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 the screen on the side here. It's gonna be very jerky. Some of you are gonna feel like seasick, right? Can we give it up for Lee one more time? Thank you, brother. Thank you for trying to, I move a lot on this platform. I apologize, right? And so every single one of us would say that in my life right now, I am fitting into one of these categories. But the the reality is the very metric, the very benchmark, the very standard that we are measuring ourselves, that the Bible says, do not measure yourselves against yourselves. In other words, don't measure where you are against a standard that hasn't come from the throne room of God. You see, many of us today will measure where we are in our lives in relation to what sits in the throne of our hearts. If Jesus is in the throne, or if the world's metric, the world's standard of money is actually on the throne. You see, if money is the determining factor of these three things, the majority of us are gonna think we're either surviving or we're failing. There are other people who maybe won't. But we cannot gauge or judge ourselves amongst a standard that the world gives. No, we need to judge ourselves against the standard that the Word of God places in our lives. Come on. You see, I have met people. You have seen them on social media, on the movies, people that their net worth if they were to pass away, could actually support an entire village in Africa for another hundred years. The very people who have the most money I have found many times without Christ are the most depressed, the most discouraged, and finances cannot be the metric as to whether or not our life is prospering. Because I have met millionaires who right now, anyone outside of Christ, I wanna tell you, you are failing. Any person that is born again here today, you cannot fail because you have Christ, the hope of glory, living on the inside of you. You are not a failure. You have a promise. God has a plan. He has a purpose. Christ in you. I don't know if you have a revelation of this. You are eternal. Hello. Your life will not end when this temporary tent passes away. We are all destined to live once and thereafter face the presence of the Lord. Come on. For to live and reign for eternity. And so I wanna take this one off the cards this morning because if you're a born again believer, you are not failing here today. The majority, I would say for a lot of us, have a perception in this auditorium that we're just surviving. We're just getting through. And often it can feel like actually I'm jumping between what feels like prospering and what feels like surviving. I wanna tell you, your matrix is, matrix is skewed. Your benchmark is skewed. If you're here worshiping the Lord Jesus in this house, you are already prospering, come on. If you're here today with your spouse that maybe you have arguments, times are not always good, but you know this person I'm gonna live with for the rest, I actually really love them, you are prospering. If your kids are at City Kids today, you are prospering. If you have some form of income, I don't know what that looks like coming into your house, you are prospering. We need a revelation today that God says, those in Christ are destined to prosper. 
We need to start throwing out metrics of the world that would dictate a lifestyle, a level of comfort, a bank balance as the determining factor to whether or not you and I are prospering. You see, prosperity does not necessarily mean that everything is going to plan. Prosperity means that you are in the will of God. If I had to define it, prosperity means that actually I am in the will of God. Come on. How many of you would say that Jesus was blessed, but Jesus was persecuted? But in a position of being blessed, it didn't eradicate persecution in his life. Prospering does not mean that you live a life exempt from making a mistake. The revelation of a prospering person is that mistakes don't make me. Mistakes don't define me. Because as far as the east is from the west, he has removed your transgressions for you. He's given you a brand new day. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. My blessings are new every day. And I'm gonna cause you perpetually to move forward. You are prospering today. We need this revelation today because as we look at a character in scripture, I want us to have these three words. And as you take it into your week, as the challenges of your working environment, of your boss, of doing life in 2024, I want you to have these words and consistently life is a series of learning, unlearning, and relearning. Reestablish yourself not against the metric of Netflix, not against the metric of Facebook or Instagram or someone famous. No, I will guide and benchmark my life according to what the Word of God says that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And so this morning, we're going to look at the life of Hezekiah, and I'm going to look at two passages of Scripture. The first passage is found in 2 Kings, the second in 2 Chronicles. It says this, 2 Kings, chapter 18, verse 1 to 7. It's going to be up on the screen. You can QR code it there. Don't worry, it's not going to ask you for money. It's going to take you straight to Bible Gateway, and you can follow along in the same version. In this third year of Hoshea, son of Ella, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old and when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones. He cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Verse 5, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him amongst all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord, I love that, and did not stop following him. He kept the commandments of the Lord that had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. I love that, come on. What is our metric of success? I wanna delve into this today, come on. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Our next passage of scripture, I want you to fill in the blanks, make sure you're with me, right? Bump your neighbor, tell them we're about to unpack this, come on. 2 Chronicles 32, after all that Hezekiah had done so faithfully, Sennacherib, king of Assyria came and invaded Judah. His land siege to the fortified cities, thinking thinking to conquer them all for. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the at the city gate and encouraged them with these words: Be and do not be or because of the king of Assyria and the vast armies with him. We've heard that promise before. For there is a greater power with us than with him. There is a greater power with you than any enemy coming up against you. There is a greater power, greater is Christ in you, come on, the hope of glory, than he who's in the world. God outnumbers any opposition that would come against you. With him is only the army of the flesh. 
but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our. And the people gained from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Hezekiah came along. He began to reign at the age of 25. The Bible tells us he was the greatest king of Judah that had existed either before him or after him. He was a revivalist at heart. He was a reformer. He reopened the doors of the temple that had been shut by his father Ahaz. He reinstituted priesthood and the line of the priests. He reinstated the Passover. This was a man who had partnered with the purposes of God. I want to tell you that Hezekiah reopened doors for someone else. Come on. This is a year of open doors. God says that he will fast track your open doors when you as a believer realize that there is a mandate upon your life to open closed doors for other people. Come on. In our families, in our colleagues, in our places of work, the people we hang out with, can we be a people this year that would open the door for someone else and watch the blessing that God will do in your life? A year of open doors, come on. A year of wide open spaces in Jesus' name. And so I wanna look very quickly at three things we see from Hezekiah and then make my main point today. You see, Hezekiah was born to the most wicked king of the entire line of kings of Judah. His father Ahaz, the Bible says, was the worst of the worst. What a juxtaposition that a man that actually opened doors, was moving with God. Everything he did was successful. He was blessed in his coming in, blessed in his going out, glory to glory, strength to strength, was the son of one of the most wicked kings ever. Let me say this. He was not bound, point number one, by the shortcomings of his family tree. Come on. In Christ today, I wanna tell you, you are not bound by your parents. You are not bound by the limitations of your culture. You are not bound by the limitations of your upbringing. Don't let your past prophesy into your future when God says, forget those things. I'm about to use you. I'm about to cause you to walk in victory. Come on, don't let what was behind you step in front of you in this season. Come on. You may today not have the background. You may say, I don't have the access to education like someone else in my row, where others have come from. You know what? The Bible says we're not living for a place of victory. In Christ, we are already victorious. We're coming from a place of victory. Yes, you may not have the resource, but God has placed in you a resilience and a fortitude to far excel the ones who just have the stuff and the things because Christ in you, the hope of glory. Come on. They may have had finances. Come on. But in him, all things are possible. Hezekiah, I love this guy. He never made excuses. He never came across as a victim. Oh, pastor, if you knew where I was at. Oh, pastor, if you knew what I'd gone through. Oh, pastor, if you knew. You know what? When you let go of those things, God's about to move you into some open doors. We need to drop some victim mentality and say, I may have come from bad, but God will use evil things for my good and move me forward in Jesus' name. He knew his God. He took responsibility. The second thing we see from Hezekiah is Hezekiah relied on the Lord. When people get to a position of authority, The wealth comes, the influence comes. And very quickly, a man who would once have served God takes his eyes and his focus onto his stature. And that's why throughout scripture, we see kings that get elevated to a point where they declare that actually they are some form of God as it was in the book of Acts. But Hezekiah remained humbled. He knew that at a base level, he was a man of prayer. I love this. Come on. See, Hezekiah was not just living la vida loca. The Bible says he had success, but he also had wars. 
Sennacherib was the king of the Assyrian army. Sennacherib comes against him with the might of his entire army. He had outward battles, and the Bible says that Hezekiah actually got, was ill to the point of death. He had internal battles. But you know what Hezekiah knew? He knew to take his battles to the Lord. He knew to humble himself. He knew to pray. Come on. See, the, the report came in. King Sennacherib, he's coming and he got a report. You know what the Bible says is he took the report. He took what was happening. He took the negativity. And the Bible says he could have done a lot of things. He could have stressed. He could have worried. He could have sat there. What am I going to do? But the Bible says that he walked to the temple of the Lord. He took the negative report. He bowed down in the temple. And the Bible says he spread out the report of the enemy wide and he began to trust God. He took it to the temple church. He took his battle to the temple. Fast forward a few years down the line and the Lord sends one angel that takes out King Sennacherib and his army, 185,000 people. This was not his battle because he knew when he took his battle to the Lord, the battle was no longer his. The battle was no longer his property. The battle was no longer his burden. Would you today take your battle to the temple? Come on. If today you would take your battle, I believe today that when opposition came, that a man would stop complaining and begin praying that God will do a miracle. He took the battle to the temple. Today, I wanna encourage you, would you bring the battle to the temple? If you bring the battle to the temple, you won't be tempted to get offended. You won't be tempted to take offense. When you take the battle to the temple, you won't be tempted. God can deal with your temper, hello. Stop taking it to Twitter. Stop taking it to Facebook. Stop taking it to social media. Stop taking it to friends who are just gonna complain all over the situation. No, this is what God's going to do. What was a threat becomes sacred because God has a battle plan. I'm taking it to the temple. Come on, church. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. In other words, your name is higher than this problem. Your name is higher than my threat right now. As it is in heaven, so let it be on earth. When we take the problem to the temple, God says, you know what? I'm about to release heaven onto that situation. I'm about to come down to that situation. When a problem comes up and we respond to the Lord in prayer, we're not coming to the Lord to inform God. We're coming to the Lord to involve God. When we come to the Lord in prayer, we're not saying, God, did you know? He already knows what you're going through. But when you come and bring it to the temple and say, God, I can't deal with this, we involve God. And you know what God does? We give God a focus point of of invasion on what the enemy is trying to forge against us in a season of hard. I want you to tell someone today, turn to someone around you, take your fingers off the text. Take your fingers off the text, man. Stop texting people with your problems. Come on. I wanna tell you, we're not taking it to a text. We're taking it to the temple. Take your marriage to the temple church today. Take that unforeseen bill, the unexpected expense. Take it to the temple. Come on. Your kids, they're all over the place. Take your kids to the temple. Come on. Take your pressure to the temple. Take your anxiety to the temple. Take your anguish to the temple. Take your sorrow to the temple because we serve a God that the Bible says cares for you, casting all of your prayers. Oh, Wednesday afternoon, long weekend, looking at the clock, 4.30, 4.35, everyone in the office is getting excited. <laughs> There is anticipation for the clock in your office to strike five. Come on. 4.57. Bing, 
bing, suddenly an email comes through for your boss. Hey, listen, this is what's happening. There's a massive problem. We need you to step in. We're, un- we're, we're very frustrated with you. We don't feel that you've been confident. Literally, do you not know that I'm about to enter a place of a long weekend? Hello? Do you not know that I'm about to, to siesta? I've already got my evening plans, and now this, it's not yours to carry. For some of us, we need a revelation right now that you know what, God, I'm coming to your house. I'm stretching that email out wide, knowing that what I cannot do, the battle that I cannot fight, my God, you can do all things, come on, in this situation, in Jesus' name. Would you take it to the temple? The third thing that we learn about this king, King Hezekiah, is that he removed the high places. He removed idolatry. He shattered sacred pillars. He cut down the Asherah pole. I was going to bring a chainsaw, have a whole thing here, cut it down. Our directors were not happy. It would have been a good illustration. (laughs) He came, he cut all of these things down. Come on. But the Bible says, not one of the kings was like him, either before him or after him. Even King Saul took down some Asherah poles, but he also left some. And the very nation where he left the Asherah poles intact was the nation that came and invaded his army. Come on. King Hezekiah said, there is no longer space in my life for the work of the enemy. There is no longer real estate for the devil to occupy my spaces that God has given me. Come on. What was Hezekiah's uniqueness? He cut them all down. Come on. He took everything down. He didn't just take a little. He took all of them. He didn't just take some that some remain. No, he took all of them. What am I saying today? Some of us today, church, we want to settle for partial redemption versus a complete breakthrough. See, as your pastor, I get excited, man. I love it when people give their lives to Jesus Christ. Someone has a salvation. I want you to be saved, but I want to tell you as your pastor here today, I don't want just you just to be saved. I want you to be set free in Jesus' name. Come on. I don't want you just to walk through into heaven with no heavenly reward, having just made a commitment. No, I want you to live for Him because your best life is found in Him in Jesus' name. Come on. I want you to give your life to Christ and surrender to him. But it doesn't stop at that moment. Jesus said in his word, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Whom the son sets free is free. You shall know the truth. John 8, 32. And the truth shall set you free. How can we stay in a place as a believer of bondage, in a partial reality of a redemption that Jesus completed in full? Hello, come on. The Bible says that he didn't die partially on that cross. He didn't partially give his life. He didn't partially give his blood on that cross. He didn't partially resurrect after three days. Don't you dare settle today for a partial breakthrough breakthrough. God says, I will not see my people bound to a perception that they are surviving when actually they are prospering because they are the ones that would seek me in Jesus' name. Don't you dare settle, church, for a partial breakthrough. If Christ did everything to make you free and you're seeing bondage, it's time to cut some things down in your life. Come on. You gotta cut some people out, cut some things down. Don't settle for that. Keep marching, hello. Keep pressing in, hello. Keep coming to church. Keep coming to our prayer meetings. I have come that you may have life and life to the... Stop accepting a little. Stop accepting less than. I want my peace back in Jesus' name. Come on. I want my joy back in Jesus' name. I want my money back. I want my marriage back. I want my children back. I'm not holding back. I'm taking it back in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. We're taking it back. Come on. This church, City Life Church, we're taking it back. 
I declare as a watchman on the wall of this church, we are taking it back. Come on. Those that would come against us, we are taking it back. Come on. Those that have robbed us, we're taking our joy back in the name of Jesus. Come on. I'm taking our peace back for this house. I'm taking back the anointing over this house. We're taking back the territory of this house. We're taking hurting people from a world out there that are failing at their lives. And we're going to see them radically transformed, not just surviving, but prospering in the name of Jesus. Come on. Woo. Three points, we're about to get where I wanted to go today. Ooh, the Holy Spirit is in this house. Ooh, thank you, Father. Hezekiah, he's done everything right. He's done what God has called him to do. Most successful king most anointed man outside of David in the Old Testament. He carried the presence, opened the temple, did all of these things. He was faithful. He was obedient. But after all of these things, the Bible says that he was attacked. Some of us sitting here today would say, you know what, God, I've been faithful, God. God, I have served God. God, I have given God. God, I have come to church. I've been part of this. I've worshiped you. My reward is a retaliation. Many of us feel that way, but I've got a revelation here for you today. Attacks are not an indication of what you're doing wrong. They are confirmation of what you're doing right in your relationship with Jesus. Come on. Attacks are strategic fights actually to prepare you not for what you've done wrong, but preparing you for what God's about to release on your life. And I want to tell you, it is a good thing. Come on. It is a blessing. It is a glory. It is a season of prospering. Come on. Would you accept that in this life, the attack will come even to faithful people? Hello. Often the Bible's biggest battles were on the cusp before crossing into the greatest promise over the lives of his people. It may be dark right now, It may look like there's nothing upon the surface. God, there's not even a plant. God, I can't even see anything coming out the soil. But God, I'm not fixated on the things that I can see. I'm going to focus on who I know God you to be in Jesus' name. Come on. We're not focusing on those things. We're not looking to the attack. We know that it's just an indication that actually we are right on time, we are right on track, and though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this is not my final destination. I'm coming through the other side. To days of glory, come on, to days of favor, to days of the blessing and purpose of God on my life, in Jesus' name. Ooh, I'm preaching bigger than, better than you're responding today, come on. How can he defeat you, the enemy? when you're eternal. How can the enemy defeat you? Did we not do an illustration two weeks ago? Christ in me, I am in Christ, and in Christ is the fullness of God. When the enemy comes, is he gonna come against God? How small is your God? Come on. See, the enemy cannot come against something that is eternal, but in a moment of attack, he can distract you from what God's actually doing in the situation. Come on, church. He can't defeat me, but he can get me to focus on something else. I declare right now, come on, in Jesus' name, no more distractions in this house. That we would awaken sleeping giants. We would rise up. We're not just surface looking Christians. We understand that there is depth to our relationship with the Lord, that He does a deep work sometimes, but that does not mean it will not break ground in Jesus' name. Some of us need to turn our phone to silent. We need to unfollow some people, come on. There are people here today, you're still following a church that you haven't been part of in five years. 
liking things from people who offended you, hurt you. The reason you're in this house was for divine healing, to get God to move you away from those people, yet you still gotta feel like you fit in. This is not high school people. God's got a better group of people right here. If you let go of some of those people, you would close a door. God will open a door on some great people in this house in Jesus' name. This is not a popularity contest, come on. We're letting go of some people. We're letting go of some social media accounts. We're letting go of celebrities who in the greatest scheme of things are living a life of failure. Yes, we pray for them, but they are not our role models. Jesus is our role model in Jesus' name. So here's a Kaya, I love this. The enemy's come and he's taken the report to the Lord. He's prayed and then he knows my hands are off it. And in that moment, as he's praying, he asked the Lord for a word. And the Lord said, be strong and courageous. You will not fight this battle. I will fight it for you. And from a place of a word, from a moment in the temple, as any good leader would do in opposition, he comes to a people that are discouraged. They've seen the size of Senna Cherub's army, the king of Assyria, and he brings a word of encouragement. And he says, you know what, people? It may not look good in the natural, but I got some good news. I've taken it to the Lord, and woo, I got a word from the Lord. Hezekiah, he comes and he says, fear not, do not be afraid. There is more with us than is with them. And suddenly the congregation, his people got bold. They got strengthened, not because of who Hezekiah was, but because of the word of God they received in that moment. Come on, we don't need a king to act as a mediator between us and God. No, we have the Holy Spirit. Some of you have forgotten the promises that God gave you this year. You will not sink. You will not fail. Whatever comes against you, you are getting to the other side. You may have got a, a word at the beginning of the year during your fasting season. Maybe you got a word at the altar at the frontier. Do not have spiritual amnesia, church. It's time to wake up, to hold on to the Word of God that I wanna tell you will envelop you with boldness. Come on, that you're gonna stand. You know what? I'm gonna be composed in chaos. Hello. I'm gonna be poised through the predicament, come on. I'm gonna be relentless in a place of adversity, why? Because I'm not standing on the words of my enemy, I'm standing on the promises of God, hallelujah. Whew. The very word strengthened in the original Hebrew text is the word samak. If you go into the Strong's Concordance and you look at this Hebrew word for strengthened, it says in that moment that they rested. Some of you today, take it to the temple, receive a word, trust that even though you can't see it, God's doing a deep work Know that God has positioned you not as a failure, not as a survivor, but as someone who prospers and begin to believe that actually I can rest. Rest, R-E-S-T. It's an acronym for something here today. Rest, R, means that the Word of God is reliable. The Word of God has stood the test of time. In 2024, the Word of God, the promise of God, the anointing on the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting right down to moan and barrack, has the power to radically transform people's lives. Come on. R, rest. E, it is eternal. In other words, it's not limited by the parameters of time because we serve a God who is outside of time. He was before all, and He is also the Omega. In Him, before all things, He was, and all things hold together in Him. Man, we're looping through the sermon. Come on, that's good. 
In Him, all things hold together. The Word of God is reliable. The Word of God is eternal. The Word of God, rest, is supernatural, R-E-S. The Word of God is supernatural. The Word of God has the power to do something that in the natural is impossible. For many of us, you know, when it comes to praying for someone and trusting God, when it comes to things of our mortality, I have seen God do miracles. Hezekiah prayed. He was about to die and the Lord extended his time, but he still died. That was not devoid of a miracle of God. We have a member and a family member in this church, Farai, who was healed of two tumors, yet he is still graduated. But I know right now he is walking in his miracle. He is healed. He is delivered. He is set free. He's dancing on streets that are golden. We will not be downcast. We will not be miserable. We will rejoice. Yes, it hurts. Yes, it's tough. But until we see him again, come on. Peter on the water, Jesus saying, come to me. He comes walking on the water in the middle of a storm and Peter understands that actually the S of rest is supernatural. In other words, Jesus, will you settle the water? He didn't ask that. Jesus, will the storm overwhelm me and envelop me? No, he said, give me a word. With a problem and impossibility in front of him, he said, God, I brought it to the temple. Jesus is our high priest in the New Testament. Jesus is our temple. Can I have a word from you? And Jesus says, come. When Jesus releases a word, he releases the power to enable that word to come to pass. And Peter begins in a place of rest to step out. It was only when he looked at the distraction. Why? Because the enemy couldn't come against him. Christ in him, the hope of glory. Him in Christ, Christ in God. Enemy can't touch this. Boom, 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 boom. Can't touch this. But in that moment, he knew actually one word from you. He gives the supernatural empowerment to transcend any impossibility. And T, I love the T. Rest is truth. The word of God is truth. In a world devoid of truth, truth is relative, truth is personal, truth changes, facts and untrue facts and all these weird things. No, Jesus is still the way, the truth and the life. Church today in your season of hard, in your season of unforeseen events, in times where you weren't expecting it, but the enemy comes in like a flood, that I would take it to the temple that I'm gonna trust Him. God, I see what the enemy has planned, but I've come to listen to what you have planned. I receive a word, the word encourages my spirit, and I learn to live not by sight, but to walk from that moment in faith, knowing that I can rest in my God. Can we stand right now in this place? I need to bring this to an end this morning. I want to end with this thought. A lot of us, prayer is difficult. I know I have faced some storms in the last few weeks and I have felt stupid sometimes going before the Lord because the pressure and my recourse to resolve what's been thrown at me, the longer I am in prayer, the less time I'm dealing with the problem. Some of you all felt like that. And you sit there thinking, God, are you even listening? It's silent, it's quiet. I'm trying to find a song. Where's the song, 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 come on. And I'm singing like a frog. Hallelujah. But I wanna tell you, God is coming into your situation. You're not telling Him to inform Him You're telling him to involve him and give him a focus point of invasion on your problem. And I wanna tell you, I walked out of there feeling like, I don't know if I've achieved much here, but I wanna tell you the problem got resolved, come on. In the book of Matthew, that story of walking on water, the Bible says, I wanna end with this. The Bible says, they fed the 5,000. Straight after feeding the 5,000, Jesus sends them away. 
he goes to a solitary place to do what? To pray. And then evening came. Jesus was praying before evening. Then in the darkest part of the night, the third watch, what is the third watch? Between the hours of three and 6 a.m., his disciples have been walking, motoring, rowing for 12 hours. Jesus is praying. In the darkest of night when the storm was raging, I want you to see this, come on church. Ooh. Jesus comes walking on the water in the supernatural right up to people that had 12 hours advance on where Jesus was. Hello, when you come to prayer, when you come to the Lord's presence, God says, I will supernaturally fast forward the result. I will propel you. I will do something that in the natural is impossible. You thought I'm gonna resolve it with all of these steps. God says, in that time of prayer, rather one day in my courts than a thousand days anywhere. I will supernaturally actually accelerate your open door in 2024 in Jesus name if you believe that give the Lord a shout of praise with every eye closed and every head bowed Oy. there's an anointing on this 8.30 I don't even know if I can preach like this at the 10.30 God's got you here He's speaking to you giving my best because I know some people are being set free today not partial salvation not partial freedom not a life of bondage but complete freedom for who the sun sets free is free indeed right now for those who are going through hard lift your hands once more Father you see every hand raised in this auditorium I thank you God that Holy Spirit you are our ever-present help in our time of need. You're a comforter. You're a counselor. You give us words of hope, words of encouragement. If any of you lack wisdom, they should ask God who gives to all generously. I thank you, Lord. This is not how their story ends. That we have a people that are not looking at a soil without a bud, but a confident faith in their heart that God is working in the unseen. this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life you've been looking for. Come on. You may have felt like you were failing. God is going to double step you because His blessings are double fold, not just to a place of survival, but a place of prospering in Him. I have come that you may have life and life to the full, an abundant life, a Zoe life. Come on. And so right now, if you're here and you've never invited Jesus into your heart, I want to give you an opportunity to respond today. He loves you. He cares about you. If you're here and you're honest with yourself, you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. There is a heaven to gain. There is an abundant life to gain. Would you open the door of your heart and let him in? Maybe today you said, you know what, I did that a long time ago. But today I'm coming home. What a great time. I got saved the week before Easter. What a great time to give your life to the Lord. If that's you, I want to pray with you and for you. I'm going to ask you to do a bold thing. On the count of three, just to slip your hand up so I can include you in my prayer. So here goes, church. One, he loves you. Two, He has a plan for your life. And three, would you lift your hand up right now? If today you're inviting Jesus into your heart for the first time, fantastic, thank you. Would you lift your hand right up so we can see your hand? One of our hosts wants to put a card and a Bible in your hand. Fantastic. Would you say this prayer with us? Lord Jesus, I come before you today and I ask you, Lord, to come into my life. I choose you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Jesus' name. Can we give those people a round of applause? Come on, you would have got a Bible and a card. It's going to help you on your journey with Jesus. Church, this week, Tuesday, I'm, we're praying for this country. We're praying for the election. But this Tuesday is Holy Week. And we're going to do something at our prayer meeting very intentional to honor 
what Christ did over this Easter season. So this is not just an ordinary prayer meeting. This is an Easter prayer meeting. Carve the time out. Tell your boss you need to be there. Come along and let's have this holy moment in the presence of the Lord together. God bless you. Have an incredible Sunday and we'll see you soon.